welcome to our all viewers. My name is Mini Vivedi Gopinathan and I'm founder of PlayStreet and I'm a RDI consultant. PlayStreet is an organization that provides educational services to help children with special needs become independent and live up to their potential. We offer parent empowerment programs and integrated schooling programs and a variety of clinical services. In recognition of Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, our focus is firmly set on the profound significance of dyspraxia. We aim for this series to shed light on the complexities of dyspraxia, address the specific hurdles people with dyspraxia face, and raise awareness about its importance within the neurodiversity movement. Today, we are on the third talk, and the segment which we are bringing today is Unraveling Dyspraxia. Yeah, exploring connections with autism and the brain. The topic for today is neurobiological underpinnings of dyspraxia. And we are honored to have Dr. Lisa Aziz today with us to share her valuable thoughts and information on the same. Welcome, Dr. Lisa. Thanks. Dr. Lisa Aziz Zadeh is a professor at the University of Southern California and also the director of the USC Center for the Neuroscience of Embodied Cognition. She has completed her bachelor's master's and doctorate in the field of psychology from the University of California in LA. Her research uses behavioral and neuroimaging methods to understand how rudimentary sensory motor systems in the brain may influence higher cognitive processing. She also investigates how the gut-brain axis influences behavior. Her work has been supported by various institutes, including the National Institute of Health, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the American Heart Association and the Tana Foundation. Welcome again, Lisa. We are so honored to have you to talk to us today. Would you like to say something to the audience before we begin? Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I really appreciate the work that you're doing, and it's wonderful. So thank you for having me. Thank you for accepting our invitation to talk to us. So let's start unraveling into the questions. It is a complex topic. We are talking about the brain and its connection to autism and dyspraxia. So I'm sure um, we will really try to make things as simple as possible for our audience to understand it. So let's start first with the connection between autism and dyspraxia. So what neurological or neurobiological factors contribute to the development of dyspraxia? Yes. Yeah, so as you know, um, about 90% or up to 90% of kids with autism have dyspraxia. Mm -hmm. And so it's very complicated to try to disentangle the autism neurobiologically from the dyspraxia neurobiologically. Um, in many ways, they're integrated and, and very similar in the brain. However, we do find that there are differences uh, between dyspraxia and autism. So for example, we find that dyspraxia is related to uh, connections between the brain and the cerebellum, mm -hmm. um, as well as the corticospinal tract. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also find a lot of cerebellar differences in dyspraxia in particular. So the cerebellum is the part of the brain that coordinates movement, uh, balance, and uh, also has some aspects of cognition as well. And so part of the uh, more motor parts of the cerebellum are impacted in dyspraxia. That is really good to know. So how, like how, um, how is it different? The cerebellar function is different in typical people versus people with dyspraxia. So what differences do we see? Yes. So one of the things that we've looked at is uh, white matter connectivity. So these are parts of the brain where there is an axon that connects uh, between them so that they can uh, touch other essentially. And so what we see is that there is less uh, connectivity in uh, kids with autism, either less or more, in some places it's more connectivity, but there's just differences in connectivity between the cortex and the pons, which connects to the cerebellum, mm -hmm. as well as from the cortex to the spinal cord, what we call the corticospinal tract. So these are the main differences that we see. We also see that when 
the kids with uh, dyspraxia are making movements, there's less activity in premotor regions. And so these premotor regions that control movement are less active for these kids. So what is the comorbidity of autism with probable dyspraxia or DCT? Right. So um, it's up to 90% of kids with autism have dyspraxia. Uh, the difficulty really is getting the co-diagnosis, at least here in the United States. So mm -hmm. a lot of times the motor difficulties are not uh, observed in the clinic and there is no test of them. Um, and they go under the radar. And so the kids lose a lot of the occupational therapy that they could be getting. So I think it's important for parents to know that this is something to look for and to advocate for in interventions and treatment. So how, how are the motor difficulties in autism related to DCD and how are they different? Yes. So DCD, the standard... Um, test for for testing for DCD is the MABC2, mm -hmm. which tests manual, dyster dyster uh, manual movements, right? Um, making um, things like, you know, moving a pin to different parts of a peg, right? Uh, balance and ball skills. So like aiming and catching. Mm -hmm. um, so when we compare kids with autism to kids with DCD, all of these are very similar. So the kids with autism and the kids with DCD have uh, equal difficulty with doing this task compared to typically developing kids. However, when we do uh, tests of praxis skills, so like imitation in particular, and in particular, meaningful imitation. So if I have, if I do something like this, like I'm combing my hair and you have to copy that. That's when the kids with autism do even worse than the kids with only dyspraxia. So there's something about this social motor communication, right? So I'm like showing you how I'm combing your my hair and you're supposed to copy it, that the kids with autism have even more difficulty with than kids who only have dyspraxia. So let's move to the next question. How are neural differences in autism similar and different to neural differences in DCD? Yes. So we described a little bit before about the differences in uh, DCD or dyspraxia, where you have these uh, connections between the cortex and the cerebellum that um, are different or between the cortex and the spinal cord, right? The corticospinal tract. Mm -hmm. Now, what we additionally see with autism is that there's a lot of activity differences in regions that are related to social communication. So it seems to be the relationship between these motor sensory regions with the frontal areas, as well as with emotion-related brain regions. In particular, we find the cingulate, which is uh, a midline structure related to emotion processing mm -hmm. and to salience, you know, understanding what information is important, um, is uh, differentially connected and differentially activated in autism. And also the inferior frontal gyrus in autism is part of the region that's important for understanding other people's intentions, understanding why they're making an action. In autism, we see that differentially activated compared to dyspraxia. So kids with dyspraxia might not have difficulty with understanding why someone is making an action, but they have difficulty with making the action itself. Whereas kids with autism have difficulty making the action and also understanding why other people are making the action. So that is exactly my, the reason for a social disconnect, if I'm right. Yes, right, exactly. Okay, yeah. So do you see structural differences in brains of people with DCD? Yes. Yeah, so those are the ones that we were describing before, where mm -hmm. it's really the structurally disconnect between these corticopontine leading to the cerebellum and cortical to the spinal cord. So do we know any reasons like why does this happen? I mean, these reasons are genetical, epigenetical. I mean, any yes. You can any insights that why that why does it even happen? Yes. So with DCD, we have less data on the genetics, but we do know with autism, there's a high genetic uh, factor 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you have a sibling with autism or a twin with autism, you're more likely that the other twin or the other sibling will have autism. So that does tell us that there's a genetic factor. Mm -hmm. Um, Additionally, we think that there might be incidents that take place uh, while the mother is pregnant. For example, infection has been related to autism. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you know, I think we're still trying to understand on, honestly. I think we still don't know why, but these are two of the factors that seem to take play in the diagnosis. Yeah. So one question I'm, I'm asking because a lot of people they ask this question. So when, when do you think the onset of BCD or autism happens? In utero, during birth, or after birth? What is your um, insights on this? Right. So, you know, the brain develops gradually. And Mm -hmm. so it could be a cascading thing where one thing doesn't work exactly the way it should. And then it cascades to a series of difficulties, right? As, as the baby develops. So perhaps it may be that it starts, something starts prenatally. And then as development continues, it, it can have cascading effects. There might also be cascading protective factors, right? So if we have early intervention, if we have early uh, diagnosis and all these things, then we can start to block some of the cascading effects. How early do you think we can start? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm not a clinician actually, so it's hard for me to say, right? It really <laughs> yes. when we can get the diagnosis, the diagnosis, usually we can't really get more than 18 months, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're the clinician more than me, but yes. yeah. yeah. That's true, yeah. So um, let's move to the next question. Why do motor outputs in individuals with dyspraxia may not accurately live, reflect their intentions? Yes, uh, so, you know, there's this idea of what you want to perform and then there's the, the neural correlates to try to get that outcome. Some of it has to do with uh, modeling the action in advance, which might be really difficult for kids with dyspraxia to do. Some of it has to do with sensory feedback, mm-hmm. right? So we we get sensory feedback, which allows us to adjust our movements, and that might be difficult for kids with autism to do. And a lot of this um, planning and error monitoring that we have to do when we make an action is also in the cerebellum which we see has uh, is compromised to some degree in dyspraxia. And so all of this together might lead to having an intention to make an action accurately and smoothly, but comes out discoordinated or difficult in dyspraxia. I would like to ask a very important question. And perhaps this is one of the most important question, not only in this discussion, but one of the most important question of the entire series, that why motor apraxia and autism is more than just a speech and a language disorder. But so many families are concerned about it. The only therapy they want to focus is on speech and language. The only difference they see is in speech and language. And a lot of underlying difficulties they are not able to see or understand or, or are aware of. So this question as a whole is perhaps going to bring a change in the understanding of a lot of parents that why motor apraxia is not just a speech or a language disorder, but much more than that. Yes. So, you know, we see um, mainly high functioning kids. So these are kids who have good language ability, who uh, often score very high in the IQ range, mm-hmm. who speech and language is not their difficulty really in, mm-hmm. as part of their autism. And yet they have these uh, very high dyspraxia uh, symptoms. And so there is, they're not necessarily related in autism. In autism, you can have very good speech and language. Mm-hmm. You can be fluent, have great conversation, and yet score very high on dyspraxia. So you're clumsy, you make a lot of motor errors, you have difficulty learning new motor skills, right? So these don't necessarily go together in what we see, especially in the high functioning group in autism. And so if that's true with the high functioning kids, it's most likely also true with the kids with the IQs lower than 80, right? And so in also in that case, you wanna distinguish these symptoms and you wanna to try to deal with each one 
as separately as possible and knowing that they are going to also impact each other. You are talking about uh, children who can talk and have good language, but um, yes. can you also talk about children who are non-verbal? I mean, I'm, they're non-speakers. It's not that they don't have language. They, they have a lot of thought process and language and when we put them on alternative and augmentative communication, they do beautifully. But they just can't do it with speech. What is happening yes. there? What do you think is happening there? Yes. So I have to start by saying that my my research is only in uh, kids that have language because they have to come to the MRI. We have to tell them what to do. Thanks. It's uh, if they, they also have to respond in certain ways. So we don't really look at the um, lower functioning population. So yeah. all the data I told you is really for the higher functioning. Uh, however, I can tell you that if we see these pathways are different in the higher functioning, they must also be different in the lower functioning kids, right? Yeah. There's not going to be uh, these cerebellar differences that are only for the higher functioning kids and not for the lower functioning kids. It's, it's really unlikely. And mm -hmm. so we can really think of the speech and language as separate systems that obviously interact and influence each other. But if you can work to uh, improve just the motor coordination, you will also be able to help perhaps the language difficulties as well. That's, I think, a very important takeaway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that we have to work on motor coordination to improve the language or speech. Yes. Yeah, that's so, right. I think that's a lot true. for this. Thanks a lot for this insight. Yes. So, are there any neuroimaging studies that have provided insights into the neurobiology of dyspraxia, and what do they reveal about brain structure and function? How is even the like, neuroimaging technology is also advancing? Yes. Uh, so for dyspraxia, in particular. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just have to tell you, I think this is just a repeat, right? I would just say the same thing I would say for the connection to the cerebellum. Are you asking something different here? So uh, what are the different neuroimaging techniques and the studies uh, which are basically it, giving us more insights? Like structurally, we are able to see things also. So what neuroimaging techniques are we used and what, what data have we bought from those studies. I see what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, in so really what we use is functional MRI. So we bring kids in, we put them inside an MRI scanner, and we have them perform actions while they're in the scanner. So we mm -hmm. could see which brain areas are active, mm -hmm. uh, when they're making different kinds of movements, whether it's imitation, whether it's emotional gestures versus just, you know, picking up a ball or something like that. Um, we also look at facial gestures, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when they are doing spontaneous uh, gestures like smiling, emotional gestures, right? Versus uh, non-emotional gestures with the face like puffing out a lip, right? Mm -hmm. Like, right? Yeah. So yeah. we also, we look at all of this inside the scanner, social versus non-social, facial versus body. And we can do that inside an fMRI scanner really well. The mm -hmm. other thing we can, in an MRI scanner is look at structure. So we can look at cortical thickness, we can look at the sizes of different areas, and we can look at connectivity. So how much connectivity do different regions have with each other? Um, EEG is another method that a lot of people use. So these are scalp electrodes. This is better for kids who can't hold still, who have difficulty inside a closed environment of an MRI, which is very claustrophobic also very loud also, which is difficult for kids with autism. Mm -hmm. So EEG can tell you brain areas that are active during different tasks. Um, and there's a lot you can also get behaviorally just to watch the kids. I think this is something OTs do a lot, measuring motor behaviors um, like the MABC praxis test and so forth. So, um... Let's also move to a um, little bit about autism. So let's let's talk a little bit about autism also. This is a very common term which we hear, motor loops. So what are motor loops? Yes. 
So a motor loop is a connection between the spinal cord mm -hmm. and the muscle, and then back again to the spinal cord. That's mm -hmm. one motor loop that uh, is connecting to the muscle. Other motor loops are going to the brain and then back to the spinal cord. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also have motor loops within the brain, right? So from the visual area where you're seeing what you want to do to the parietal areas, which help you with praxis, which shape should you move your hand to, to the frontal regions that are doing uh, the movement of the muscles, the premotor, the planning, and so forth. So there's different levels of motor loops as we look from the spinal cord to the muscle, the spinal cord to the brain, and the within the brain itself. Um, and all of these can have different impacts in autism and dyspraxia. So, this motor loops are like they're the typical. Uh, I mean, are they responsible for typical functioning, or generally motor loop is uh, only we only see them when we see some stereotypical motor movements. So, when exactly do we call a motor movement a motor loop? When it is unintentional, uncontrollable, or can we have controlled and volitional motor loops also? You can definitely, especially in the cortical level, you have volitional uh, motor loops. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the level of the spinal cord, you can have some that are not conscious, right? So these are just motor reflexes that you have, uh, especially from the spinal cord to the muscle and back. We have a lot of these kinds of sp uh, reflexive motor loops. How do they affect the function? Um, yeah, so you can definitely have... Uh, reflexes or motor loops that are not functioning correctly. And that's really a uh, some kind of uh, deactivity or uh, problem in the connectivity of the motor loop, either from the spinal cord to the muscle or, by, or going backward. I don't know whether this question is uh, relevant here or not, but let me just ask it in case uh, it could be answered. So we are, we are listening, we are hearing a lot about primitive reflexes these days. So do you think if these motor loops are like uh, uh, not able to integrate the reflexes which the infants are happening? So is it something to, something can lead to primitive reflex disintegration? Is there any connection? If I'm just asking out of curiosity because you use I, the word I, reflexes. <laughs> yes, I, I guess I'm not, I don't know what you mean. So like is, can you repeat what you mean? So for example, question. for example, kids when they're born, when they're just born, they they do not have any postures or any movements or their volitional movements. So they are dependent on reflexes, like rooting reflex. So when yeah. the nipple of the mom touches the corner of the mouth, automatically they start suckling so that they can they can feed themselves. Yeah. So a lot of such reflexes are there. So we see that in children with uh, autism and in dyspraxia also, these reflexes later on, they do not get integrated and become postural uh, motor, motor movements. They do not become meaningful motor movements. They retain for, for their life uh, lifetime if we do not work on them. So these, like, we call them as primitive reflexes. They actually should be vanished after a few months, but they always remain leading, uh, leading to very primitive motor functions of our children. So what I want to ask is, are those reflexes which are which are seen during infancy, which are part of the infant, infant development, are related to motor loops? That is, the, the motor loops are incorrect, they have an impact on reflexes? Or if the reflexes don't integrate, the, the stereotypical motor loops keep on developing? And yeah, children I mean, do not attain right or yeah. meaningful motor movements or posture. I think this, these are really great questions, but mm -hmm. I don't think I have the answer for you. <laughs> no, I, no problem. We, we really study the brain, you know, yeah, and sure. we don't look at the spinal cord as much. So okay. I'm sorry, I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer on this one. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so again, I think there's a follow-up question to motor loops. How can we recognize motor loops in children with dyspraxia or autism? And how can we help them? I mean, any, do we have any strategy to help them? from a perspective? Right, so I think one of the it, motor loops that's really important in autism is having sensory feedback for what you're performing so that you can adjust your performance mm -hmm. and do what we call error monitoring, right? So monitor any errors you have and adjust accordingly so you can make the right action. 
And I think that in, in autism and dyspraxia, this might be a particular difficulty mm -hmm. um, because we see that the cerebellum, which is part of this error monitoring uh, neural region, is not working in the same way. Um, and so perhaps by providing more sensory feedback, providing more uh, understanding of how to make the changes that the child needs to make to make the action correctly, we can help these motor loops be missing some of the information that they're getting. Hmm, right. So do you, so more sensory processing integration or more sensory uh, strategies yeah. is really going to be helpful as an early intervention. Exactly, that's right. Okay. Uh, I think we have come to the last question related to autism. Uh, is there a connection between emotional regulation and dyspraxia or emotional regulation and autism? Yes. Um, so one of the really interesting things that we find in our study is that we find that the relationship between um, making these uh, errors when you're doing imitation mm -hmm. is related to how well the child performs on affect recognition. So affect recognition is me being able to tell, are you happy from your facial expression? Are you sad? Are you angry? So the kids who have more difficulty telling other people's facial expressions also have more praxis difficulties. And so there's some relationship between this social processing, right? Socio-emotional processing with praxis skills that I think is really interesting. The other thing that we see is that activity in the brain regions uh, related to imitation is also related to SRS scores, which are scores on social abilities, and also related to autism severity. So the more severity of autism that you have, really meaning social communication deficits, right, which is the hallmark of autism, is related to these activity in these motor brain regions. So definitely all of it is connected in uh, very powerful ways, yeah, that we don't fully understand yet. And where do mirror neurons sit in all of this? <laughs> mirror right. neurons. Mirror neurons, <laughs> right. mirror neurons are neurons that are active both when I make an action and also yes. when you make an action. Right. So help me with understanding your intentions, with understanding why you're doing what you're doing and so forth. Um, and so we do see that kids with autism in particular have difficulty when they're watching other people make actions, but kids with only dyspraxia don't have that difficulty. And so really that's the inferior frontal gyrus that we were talking about. Um, it's also that activity in that brain region is related to autism severity. It's also related to SRS scores. Um, and so it does seem to be an important part of this story that we still don't fully understand. We also find white matter connectivity to this region is more compromised in autism than in dyspraxia or in typicals. So what do you think where our research is going? I mean, I know you are you all are doing such great work and because of your work, we clinicians are able to put your work into practice and able to serve the families and the children. And with so many of the answers which we do not have any information about. So what do you think by when? I mean, tentatively, when do you think we can even have better understanding of all these complexities? Like, where is the research going towards? Yes. Um... <laughs> You know, the I think that what's happening in with autism research is that more and more we're also trying to branch out and to see it from a more whole body perspective. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we also study in my lab is relationships with the gut microbiome um, right. and how these the metabolites from the gut microbiome modulate brain regions, which then modulate behavior, right? Um and so I think that more and more, we're going to see this kind of whole body perspective. We're going to try to understand what's going on in utero a little bit better, hopefully. Um, and all of this, you know, the hope is that can have profound effects for what we do with interventions, either during pregnancy, after pregnancy, or later in life. From the bottom of my heart, I'm looking forward to that day. 
<laughs> Me too. <laughs> yes. yeah. So I think with this very insightful discussion, we come to the end of this amazing interview. And I really wish the time stops here and we can continue talking. Uh, but it never happens. So, <laughs> on behalf of Pay Street team, I would really like to thank you, Lisa, for taking the time to share your insights and expertise with us today. Your perspectives have added valuable depth to our understanding of neurobiology of dyspraxia and, of course, a lot about autism too. To our viewers, we hope you found this interview insightful. If you have any questions or would like to share your thoughts, please feel free to connect with us. At Play Street, we offer a special program and we call it as the Dyspraxia Program, which, encom which encompasses intensive occupational therapy, sensory integration processing, sensory integration, primitive reflex integration, speech therapy, where we do a lot of sensory motor approach to speech and, feed, speech and feeding, physiotherapy for posture, gait, coordination, a sensory rhythm-based music and a movement program called Upbeat, and of course, co-regulation. So if you if you feel that your child might have the difficulties with the, which Dr. Deza has explained, please feel free to contact us for further details. Thank you again for being part of this conversation. Have a great day. Bye-bye.